Good evening. If you would, grab a Bible and let's turn to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians 4. That's where we'll begin in this part of our worship where we open the Word of God together and study from it. Ephesians chapter 4. This is the last time that uh, I'm going to be before you this week, and so I need to say a few things, if you'll just pardon me for a moment. Uh, I want to tell you, uh, I have just had a fantastic week being with you. And uh, very often when uh, these kinds of things happen, people will tell me all the uh, encouragement and positive things they can, and uh, so I don't always get to say those things in such a uh, direct way as you do. But now that I have an opportunity, I just want to say you have encouraged me this week. It has been a blessing for me to be here, and I want to thank you for all the encouragement you've given me and the kind words, but I, I want to say more than that, I appreciate what I've seen in you more than anything you've done or said to me. Uh, to be able to see God's people in harmony, working together, showing love to each other, uh, the love that you guys have for each other is obvious, and uh, I appreciate that because... Uh, that's not something that's about me or any one event. That's something that has obviously been building as the Lord has been working here. And so I am encouraged by that. Thank you for all the uh, kind gestures you have made toward me, those who have opened up their homes and fed me and taken care of me. As I said, I'm here without my family, which means it's a lot harder to like me than it normally is. Uh, but you have been kind to me anyway, and I appreciate that greatly. I am, uh, I'm planning on leaving tonight uh, to go on back home. Uh, in the Gospel of Luke, it talks about how Jesus set his face to go to Jerusalem. And tonight I will set my face for College Station. I don't plan to uh, make any stops along the way. But uh, I appreciate you and your prayers about that so that I can uh, return home safely. Thank you so much for this week. I want to begin by reading in Ephesians 4 and verse 11. Ephesians 4 and verse 11. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints... For the work of ministry for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine by human cunning by craftiness in deceitful schemes. Maturity is something that we all want if you're curious about that, do we really want to be mature? Just imagine if someone called you childish or immature or a baby or naive or foolish. Those are not compliments. They are insults. And we take them as such because we want to be viewed as mature. We want to be mature and we want other people to acknowledge that. And the New Testament takes those pictures that we talk about in terms of physical development and emotional development, and it applies those things to spiritual growth. So we are spiritual babes. We need milk. Or here, we are children who are tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine to say that maybe there should be a time when we grow up and we become more stable and wiser. The funny thing about spiritual growth, though, is that it's not as clearly visible as physical growth. If someone's growing physically, it's pretty obvious to all of us. I have teenagers at home, and I watch them grow. One of them has grown past me. The other's close to growing past me. And uh, it's obvious. I don't wonder whether they've grown. It's clear. But spiritual growth is different. You know, just because someone gets older doesn't mean they grow closer to God. I think we've all known people who are quite old but are not wise. And so all their years of living haven't benefited them because they haven't matured. So spiritual growth is not nearly as clear as physical growth. So the question becomes, if I don't become more mature simply by getting older, how do I do it? And I want to pursue that idea for a few minutes tonight. Because I want to talk about what we're going to call the missing link to maturity. Sometimes it seems to me, especially as I deal with younger people who are passionate and interested in spiritual growth... That we want so badly to become mature, and yet the process is difficult. How do I get there? And in some ways, it's not a process that you can just break down and say, here's what you do, and you do this, and you do this. But I want to talk about one particular aspect of maturity. That I believe if we can develop this in several different arenas, suddenly we'll find ourselves wiser and farther along. We're going to talk about what we're going to call discernment. The Bible's word is discernment. I, I want to tell you the story of this sermon briefly. 
I was asked to, to write a sermon about discernment. And I knew that discernment was a big deal biblically, and I, I had some inkling that it would be profitable to study. But as I developed this lesson, I found that this word has its tentacles much farther out than I could have ever imagined. And I want to show you the scope of this idea, and I hope you'll be impressed by it. And then at the end of the lesson, we're going to come back and talk about, all right, now that we know why we need discernment, how do we get it, and what do we do? So let's talk about maturity and discernment. First, I want to tell you that maturity requires discerning voices. So in the text in front of us, the one we just read, God gives gifts so that the people with the gifts can teach the entire group. And the goal, it says in verse 13, is that we can all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So there is growth that God wants to happen, and he has put gifts in the church to accomplish that growth. We help one another grow. But look at verse 14. It says, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ. So here he says, being mature means discerning between what he calls every wind of doctrine, that's in verse 14, and what is the truth, that's in verse 15. How do you tell one from the other? They both sound like teaching. In fact, if you were to ask every wind of doctrine, they would probably say, no, I'm teaching the truth. How do you tell? The answer is discernment. This word discernment means to tell one thing from another. So when we exercise discernment and we gain discernment, we can tell this is this and that is that. There is a difference between two things that may look the same. And we need badly this skill when it comes to voices. The things that we hear and the things people claim, can we trust them? Are they the truth or are they every wind of doctrine? Will they lead me closer to the mature manhood this verse describes? Or instead, are they going to lead me to be tossed to and fro? The picture, by the way, is of a sailboat that it really is that it's subject to the whims of the wind. And so the wind blows this way and the sailboat goes this way and the wind blows this way and back and forth it goes. Instead of the biblical picture of stability like a tree deeply rooted, we become sailboats that go this way and that way depending on what we hear. Behind Paul's admonition here is the idea that error does not advertise itself as error. Instead, it masquerades as truth. So how will we ever know the difference? Think about it. Here are a couple of passages to help us along this line. This is 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 19 to 22. It says, do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophecies, but test everything. Hold fast what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. So here is a passage that says, don't quench the spirit. Don't despise prophecies. God may be speaking to you through what someone is saying. So don't despise it. But on the other hand... What someone is saying to you may be total error, so don't just accept it either. What's the solution? Test everything and hold fast what's good and abstain from what is evil. Or 1 John 4 and verse 1 talks about sort of the other side of that. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, for many false prophets have gone out into the world. I want you to notice that in both of these texts that I have on the board, in both of these texts, there are two dangers. The one danger is, if we just ignore every voice, then we will block out God's voice too. We don't want that. Don't quench the spirit, he says. But on the other hand, there is the danger of gullibility. That if we just believe every spirit, we're in trouble then too, aren't we? We have to be able to discern. Is what we are hearing from God... Or is what we are hearing from man? Is what we are hearing the truth? Or is what we're hearing every wind of doctrine? Which is it? We have to be able to tell the difference. Go with me to Philippians chapter 1. Turn over a page or two. Philippians chapter 1. We'll talk a little more about voices and discernment here. Philippians 1 and verse 9. Paul writes, Philippians 1, 9. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment. So that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. It's a prayer, he says, that the Philippians will grow in discernment so that, verse 10, you may approve what is excellent. 
So behind that phrase is the idea that we have to be able to tell the difference between what is excellent and what is not excellent, what is going to lead us toward the Lord and what will lead us away from him. Jesus says something similar. This is John 10, verses 3 and 4 and 5. He says, speaking of the, the shepherd, the good shepherd, the sheep hear his voice, they follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. Follow Jesus, follow the shepherd, don't hear the other voices. Do you hear the difference, the discernment? Beautiful thing is when you read about sheep in the Middle East and how each shepherd has his own unique voice or call and sometimes there will be a mass of sheep all gathered together and then shepherds will come and they'll speak and they'll call their sheep and all that shepherd sheep will come after him. They know his voice, but they don't come at the call of another shepherd. And so we are with Jesus. We hear his voice, but we do not know the voice of strangers. All right, so I've been using this idea of voices. Let me explain what I mean and be a little clearer. We're going to hear a lot of voices People will share their opinions about certain behaviors, about certain teachings, about certain issues. They'll share them on social media. Our friends will express themselves. We'll hear from authors and podcasters and celebrities and movies and scientists and grandparents and politicians and preachers. Lots of voices. Some of them will sound immediately right We'll say, yeah, I like that. And some of them will sound immediately wrong and we'll recoil and say, no, that's not it. Some will draw us in and make us wonder. Mature people, mature people are those who can discern and listen for the voice of Jesus. Who can say, I test all things and I only hold fast what is good. And if we want to grow to maturity... This is an essential skill to be able to weed out of all the voices in our world, all the things that are going to lead us away from the Lord and listen for the voice of truth, the voice of Jesus. Maturity requires discerning voices. Second, whoop, second, maturity requires discerning appearance from reality. I want you to go with me to Matthew chapter 7 for this. Matthew 7, Jesus is concerned about this and he wants his disciples to be concerned about this in Matthew chapter 7. Matthew 7, we're going to read here beginning in verse 15. And I want you to notice as Jesus teaches about this, that Jesus is concerned about a particular discernment issue, how somehow our discernment can malfunction. Matthew 7 and verse 15, he says, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. So Jesus says some appearances, sheep's clothing, are different from the reality. Ravenous wolves. And the difference there matters, especially if you're a sheep and you suddenly find yourself face to face with a ravenous wolf. It's a big deal when you don't understand the difference between appearance and reality. What Jesus is getting at, the malfunction he is zoning in on, is the idea that we tend to judge people by appearances. What we see, what we think on first impression, our immediate thought about them. If they look bad to us, they must be bad. If they look good to us, they must be good. And Jesus encourages us to go deeper. Beware of false prophets who come to you looking like something, but inwardly there's something else. And he says, the way you judge them is never by appearances. It must always be by their fruits, by their works. Jesus says, the answer here is discernment. Look at their fruits, not just their mouths. Look at their fruits, not just what you think when you first meet them. Look deeper. Maturity comes when we can discern the difference between what someone appears to be and who they really are. Now, this may seem like a completely random tangent to you, and if so, I apologize that you don't think this is relevant, but I just want to say what comes to my mind when I think of the difference between appearance and reality is the fact that sometimes 
we tend to get excited about a certain person without really waiting for time to go by and us to see the fruit and the end result of their behavior. And so I believe that's one of the reasons why we have statements like these about the appointing of elders. In 1 Timothy 3 and verse 6, he must not be a recent convert or he may be puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. Or about deacons, let them also be tested first, then let them serve as deacons if they prove themselves blameless. And then Paul's instruction to Timothy in chapter 5 and 22, do not be hasty in the laying on of hands, nor take part in the sins of others, keep yourself pure. There must be something here where Paul says, be careful about this. Don't be hasty. Let them be tested. Make sure they're not a novice or a new convert. Because there's something here about perhaps the appearance will not be the reality. And you need to be careful about that. If the church puts their imprimatur on someone and says, this is a good man, this is one we want to lead us, when in actuality they are not what they appear to be, great damage can result. Understanding the difference between appearance and reality is the key to wisdom. This is what wisdom is. In fact, if I were to ask you, what's the theme of the book of Proverbs? You would probably say, Proverbs doesn't have a theme. Because, I mean, it's a, ho a whole bunch of random sayings, right? I do believe Proverbs has a theme. And I believe the theme is, things are not always what they appear to be. That's the way we should live life. Understanding that things are not always what they appear to be. And Solomon is saying to his son, watch out, things are not what they appear. Wisdom comes by discerning the difference. Let me give you some examples. This is Proverbs 13 and verse 7. One pretends to be rich, yet has nothing. Another pretends to be poor, yet has great wealth. What's the appearance? By the way, people still do this, don't they? Where they flaunt stuff they don't have and pretend to be rich. And then sometimes you find out very rich people don't look so rich. Maybe that's even how they got to be rich. Appearances and reality, not the same. Treasures gained by wickedness do not profit, but righteousness delivers from death. That's not how it appears. Hey, treasure is good treasure no matter how you got it, right? Well, Solomon says, no, it's not what it appears. Whoever spares the rod hates his son, but he who loves him is diligent to discipline him. You know, if you were to look at, here is the parent who disciplines his child, you would say, man, you're hurting your child. How could you do that? You must not love him. When in reality, it's the person who refuses to discipline, who actually hates their son. Do you see how it switches? The appearance and the reality are different things. There's wisdom in knowing the difference. Proverbs 15, 16, and 17. Better is a little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure and trouble with it. Better is a dinner of herbs where love is than a fattened ox and hatred with it. No, Solomon is not supporting salads here. He is saying, you think it would be great to have a big, fancy, expensive meal. But he says, no, there's, there's more important things than how much money you have. If you've got your fancy steak dinner, but everybody hates each other, it'd be better to just have salad. You see, the appearance and the reality are different. One of my favorite proverbs, like a gold ring in a pig's snout, is a beautiful woman without discretion. She appears to be a certain way, but in reality, it's not so great. It appears to be great, but her lack of discretion is a much bigger deal, kind of like the waste it is to have a gold ring in a pig's snout. So the point here, the point here is that when we learn to discern what an appearance is from what the reality is, suddenly we become more mature. And Solomon is trying to give us wisdom to say, look at a situation and think more deeply. Don't just take things at face value because sometimes face value is wrong. Third, maturity requires discerning good from evil. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 5. Hebrews 5. All right, so if you're worried I have a three-point sermon and I'm almost done, let me warn you. Appearances can be deceiving tonight. We have five points tonight. So I won't be here forever, but I will be here longer than three points. Hebrews 5. Let's read beginning in verse 12. Hebrews 5 and verse 12. This is where the Hebrew writer has had to interrupt his argument. He wants to talk about Melchizedek, but he has to stop and kind of chew them out. Because they haven't grown like they should, so they can't understand him. Hebrews 5 and verse 12, he says, For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. 
You need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness since he is a child. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. So I want you to notice particularly verse 14. That the mature are those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. They can tell the difference between good and evil. And in this text, he does not say that's simply a function of how well they know the Bible, although that is certainly implied. In this text, he says, they know the difference between good and evil because of what he calls, in my version, constant practice. Or yours might say, by reason of use. They've been practicing discernment in their regular lives, and now they know the difference between good and evil. Everybody lives lives, including us, that are full of good and evil. We see it all around us. We make decisions, and we see how those decisions go. And we have people in our lives, and we see them make decisions, and we see how those decisions go. And we see the nature of influence, and we see how evil grows and spreads. And sometimes we see how good grows and spreads. My question is, we're living a lot of life. Are we learning anything? What are we getting out of all of this life? He says, mature people are those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern good from evil. His words imply that we have a heightened awareness of the spiritual dimension of the decisions that we make. That we know something else is going on besides just people living life and sometimes having good times and sometimes having bad times. That there is a good and evil dimension that we need to see. Now it doesn't seem to me in this text to imply that we're talking about black and white issues of immorality. You know, someone is sinning, and so now I have to discern, is that good or evil? It's pretty obvious when someone is sinning that sin is sin. But what is not so obvious are those gray areas, those situations that are unclear, those times we have to make a judgment call about something. Sometimes there are decisions that lead in a good direction or a bad direction. They may not be sin themselves, but they're kind of on the way to sin. What he is saying is that mature people know the flavor of sin. And they know what sin sounds like and what it feels like and where it leads. They know it by reason of use. They have their senses exercised to discern it. And they also know what good flavor is. And they know how that leads toward better things. And they know what might be a positive thing or what might be a negative thing because they have experienced it and seen it in the lives of others. And now they're ready to make better decisions as a result of their thinking and their living. That's maturity. And if we want to grow to be more like Jesus, we have to have our eyes opened to the good and evil, not just in the pages of Scripture, but the good and evil that's living out all around us. And say, that's how I can discern what I need to do and be in 2022, right now, and how I can choose to follow the Lord. Let's go to Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5. I want you to notice as we read these texts that there seems to be this sense that we have some judgment we need to make in the lives that we live. Ephesians 5 and verse 8. Paul writes... For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light, excuse me, light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. Drop down to verse 15. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Try to discern, he says, what is pleasing to the Lord. Understand what the will of the Lord is. He is saying, take these principles like, like have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. Take these principles out into the world and live them. Discern, how do I do that now? What do I need to do in this situation? Because I know the will of the Lord. So what's the will of the Lord in this situation? You see, we're taking Scripture and we're applying it and living it. That's discernment, where we can tell good from evil 
because we're trying to live it. There's a similar passage. This is Romans chapter 12 and verse 2. Where Paul writes, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. By testing you may discern. So we learn to recognize God's will as good and acceptable and perfect as we test it and we see it. We keep testing it. And this is what we keep finding. We keep finding that when we do God's will, it is good and acceptable and perfect. And so we keep doing it. And we find this is what's good. The idea here is that good and evil in our world don't always come with labels. People don't wear the name tag that say, hi, my name is good. We have to figure it out. And sometimes, just like us, people are a blend between good and evil. Sometimes their ideas are good and sometimes their ideas are evil. Sometimes the things they say in one moment are good and in another moment are evil. It is discernment that helps us to see this is how we should understand and how we should act as a result of good and evil as we see it. Fourth, maturity requires discerning appropriate action. Let's go to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew 16. All right, don't slow down on me. We got two more. We got this one and number five. So we're, we're getting to the bottom of our list. There's always a moment in a sermon when you can feel the audience says, oh, we got more to go here. Okay, so I want you to stay with me. We're, we're moving through this. But we have some really important ideas here in Matthew 16 that I want to say is another direction discernment goes. We're seeing how far its tentacles stretch out into life. So let's talk about appropriate action. Matthew 16 and verse 1. And the Pharisees and Sadducees came, and to test him, they asked him to show them a sign from heaven. He answered them, When it is evening, you say, it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning, it will be a stormy today, for the sky is red and threatening. You know how to interpret the appearance of the sky, but you cannot interpret the signs of the times. An evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah. So they approach Jesus, you know, perform a sign for us. And Jesus talks about their weather prediction. It's a weird response, isn't it? What I believe Jesus is saying is that he is amazed at the capacity they have to read the weather. Incredible skill, intuition, experience. And also this sense of, well, what should I do today? How should we respond to what we believe the weather is going to do? All of that, you can do all of that with the weather. But when the Son of God comes doing signs, you don't realize that maybe a better reaction would be to repent and follow him instead of asking for more cool signs. Jesus says, how can it be that you know what's appropriate in other realms, but in the most important realm, you don't get it? I might translate this into modern times. This is the way I think of this. It is amazing to me that there are people who have attained a tremendous level of skill in their professions. Really, we might call it skill and timing. So I made a little list. There are people who know exactly when to buy and sell stocks and bonds. Just the right moment. There are people who know exactly when to switch from a man defense to his own. Just the right moment. There are people who know exactly when to hardball a negotiation or just exactly when to give in. There are people who know just by looking at it when a dish is cooked to perfection. Just look. There it is. Take it out. But what about if those same people then turn around and with all that skill and all that incredible sense of timing... They have no clue when is the right time to show kindness to someone or to stand up for what's right or to reach out to someone in need. Wouldn't we say, you know, all that skill is cool, but does it really matter? If you don't know when action that's spiritually important is appropriate, then all that skill, all that genius is sort of a waste. That's what he's saying. You can watch the skies. That's pretty cool. It's a neat trick. So what? You can't recognize the Messiah. What good is it? 
This kind of discernment. The kind of discernment that says something needs to happen now. It's time for a certain kind of action. Shows up in some Bible stories. It is actually a word that's used of a couple of Old Testament figures. One is Joseph that we talked about uh, already this week. Joseph is called a discerning man. Because he not only learns that there will be a famine throughout the whole world, but what does he do? Because there's going to be a famine, he has a plan. And he says, we need to collect the grain and we need to store it. And then we need, when time comes, to sell it to everyone. And even get all the farmers to sell us their land. And so Joseph has a plan. He knows when appropriate action needs to be taken. He is a discerning man. And Abigail is called a discerning woman. You may remember Abigail. She is the woman who is married to a guy whose name is Fool, which makes you wonder what his parents were thinking. Maybe they knew something. But she's married to this man whose name is Fool, and then she has to go apologize because David is coming to exterminate her family with his army. And yet she knows that if I go and head him off and I speak kindly to David and I give him these gifts, I can talk him down and save our lives. And she does. She is a discerning woman because she knows when appropriate action is needed. So if you want to be mature, part of maturity means developing the discernment to know when you need to act. What kind of action will help and when it's time to act. And fifth, maturity requires discerning spiritual reality. Look with me in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians 11. I will use this text in this point at the risk of opening a can of worms. I don't intend to open cans of worms, uh, but this is one of those texts where worms just seem to spill out no matter how we open the can. But I want to talk about what Paul says here about the Lord's Supper, specifically in 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 27. Paul is correcting the way the Corinthians are taking the Lord's Supper. This is what he says, 1 Corinthians eleven twenty-seven: 27. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. So there's some speculation here about what does he mean by the phrase in verse 29, discerning the body. Is he talking about when we eat this bread that we realize we're eating the body of Jesus? It's not just bread, but it has a significance that's beyond the bread. Or is he talking about body in the sense of the church? That as his focus is a lot in this chapter, we take the Lord's Supper as a body. We come together to partake. And I have my opinions about that that really aren't important for the lesson. What I want to say is no matter which approach you take, Paul is using that word body to emphasize that something is happening when we take the Lord's Supper that's more than you and me eating some bread and drinking some juice. There is a spiritual reality going on. And if you partake of that without discerning that, then he says you're guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. That makes discernment vital because we need to know that what we do when we gather together is not just physical. It is spiritual. Think about it. When someone goes down into the water, for all the world, it looks as though someone's just taking a bath, just getting wet. But Christians know that when someone goes down into the water, they are asking the Lord to cleanse them of their sins. They are doing something that makes angels rejoice. They are joined with Christ in death and raised to walk in new life. Something is happening there that our physical eyes can't see, but our spiritual eyes must see. There is a spiritual reality to the physical things that we do. When we are tempted to sin, there is a spiritual battle going on. Paul writes, 
that we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and rulers and authorities and the cosmic powers over this present darkness. Spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. That's what happens when we engage with temptation. It is not just, oops, I made a mistake. It is instead good and evil fighting over our spirit. Spiritual realities mean that we are aware there is more to the things we do than what we see. Mature people see the spiritual implications of ordinary things because they have learned to discern. All right, I hope all of that leaves you asking the big question, which is, how do I develop discernment? If it is requiring for me to discern voices and appearances from reality and good from evil and appropriate action and spiritual reality, what can we say about how we develop discernment? First of all, we have to start with Scripture. Discernment begins with an intense, deep understanding of what God has revealed. These are the things God wants you and me to know. This is what it is. If you want to be mature, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. Let it live in you. Drink it in. Read scripture, sing scripture, pray scripture, talk scripture, ask questions about scripture, think about scripture. Let scripture be your focus. And you will find as you grow, as you mature physically and spiritually, that some scriptures will resonate more than others. And some will come to life. And sometimes you'll go through experiences and you'll say, that, that has come alive to me. And sometimes you'll begin to say, I never saw that before. That's pretty neat. I have passages that are uniquely powerful to me. I have some that I think are the most important to me. And I have some that are dear to me because they have smacked me in the face. I hope you have those too. Start with Scripture. Scripture is how we tell truth from lies. If we want to discern anything and say this is good and this is bad, we have to go to Scripture. If we're going to test any voice, Scripture is going to be the test. Scripture is how you know the essentials of God's will so that then you can take those essentials out into the world and apply them. But if you don't start with Scripture, then we're just sort of on our own. And your judgment is just as good as mine. Scripture is how we know what is spiritually real and what is going on in a spiritual realm beyond us. Second, watch for the spiritual dimension. I just want to encourage you, as you go through your day, think about how the things you see and hear and think might fit into the categories of good and evil. Be aware of that. Because remember, good and evil don't come with labels. We must label them. So who will label your thoughts and your actions and your voices if not for you? Think about how you are growing. That might be helpful if you, if you think about where you are in a certain arena of spiritual growth versus where you were a year ago or five years ago. And you begin to say, you know, something is changing in me. I see a difference with who I used to be. Think about the battle that you're fighting and how it shows up in your life. I want to remind you that we are fighting a battle and that Satan has a plan for you. In fact, we are told about the plans of Satan in Scripture. Now, I might suggest to you that watching for the spiritual dimension may require some retooling of our thinking. Uh, the example that I like to use is the idea of church. So when I, I say the word church, I think we all have a picture that pops up in our heads. Most of the time, that's a cultural picture. You know, we talk about church, we think about buildings, sometimes we think about denominations, and we think about maybe what we do when we're together. But biblically, church is the people of God. Church is the beloved of God. Church are those who belong to him. So it's about people, and my vision of church and my thinking about church always needs to be about people. And when I think about the people who are a part of the church, when I think about my brothers and sisters in Christ, I can never forget that you guys are the fulfillment of God's dream. Jesus said, I will build my church. You belong to him. And when I insult my brothers and sisters or I ignore them, or I talk bad about them and gossip about them, 
Think about who I'm really dishonoring. There's a spiritual reality that we may not see if we focus on the physical. How do I develop discernment? Learn from failures and successes. The Hebrew writer talks about those who by constant use have their senses exercised to discern good from evil. When things go well in spiritual ways, when you resist temptation, when you grow, when you bless other people, ask the question, why? Why did I grow? Why did I succeed? What went well here? These may be the most important thoughts you ever think. And when you fail, when things break down, ask why. What went wrong? Discernment says, when I get burned, I would prefer to not do the same dumb thing again. So how will we get better? It is the height of foolishness when we make a mistake to say, you know, I'm embarrassed by that. I don't want to think about it anymore. I just want to move on and forget. It is the height of foolishness because what can we learn when we don't take the time to sit down and investigate what went wrong? But I might add, we have a tremendous blessing and that we get to learn from other people's failures and successes too. There are a whole lot, a lot of people around us, and guess what? They're making mistakes all the time, and sometimes they're doing things that are good. So we have a wealth of information. That's the, the beauty of the world that we live in and what God has given us in terms of experience. As you get a little older and you begin to say how many different people you've known who have gone down this path and done this thing or tried this out or made this suggestion, suddenly you begin to see the paths become a lot clearer because we can learn from the failures, and very often from the successes too of others. I develop discernment by living proactively. I want to encourage this as something for us to all chew on. Joseph and Abigail see the problem coming and act. Famine's coming, let's store up some grain. David's coming, let's go out and see him. Better act now, Not, don't want to wait. Don't want to hem and haw. Don't want to convene a council so that we can all decide what we can do. Something needs to happen now. That's discernment. We don't have to wait for the crisis to be fully developed before we see that something is a problem. So let me give you a few examples here. If you know that you might have hurt someone's feelings, you can just go fix it. You don't have to wait for them to get their feelings hurt and then not talk to you for a month and then you ask some people about it and then they talk to some people about it and then maybe six months later somebody finally calls somebody you can just say I think I might have hurt your feelings I'm sorry about that proactive sometimes when I'm talking sometimes even happens when I'm preaching I realize that I've said something foolish or even untrue and I've been, because sometimes when you do that, it's embarrassing to stop and say, wait a minute, I, that's not what I meant to say. Wait a minute, that's actually not true. I don't know why I said that. Instead of stopping, we, we're embarrassed a little, and so we just, we just go on, and it just sticks in the back of your mind. And then it grows, and it, you, it bothers you, and it nags at you, and your conscience bothers you. And so after a, a few days or, or weeks, you finally get the courage of, hey, I've got I've to talk to you about something. You know what would be wise, what would be discerning is just to say, when I say it, why don't we just stop right now and say, you know what, I don't want this to be a thing. Sorry about that. Proactively. How about this? If you see that your kids are headed in a bad direction, do you have to let them go all the way to the end of that path? Maybe there's wisdom in saying, I don't really like saying anything about this. I don't really want to get in their face, but somebody needs to say this isn't going well. Live proactively. If we see problems in the future, we can position ourselves to be ready for the problem. But there is a foresight and a willingness to act that discernment brings. So if you want to develop discernment, Think about how you can be proactive in doing good and preventing evil. 
And finally, if you want to be discerning, listen to the wisdom of others. One of the beautiful things about wisdom is that you can borrow it. It doesn't have to come from you. And borrowed wisdom is just as good as personal wisdom. In fact, sometimes you can just adopt it and say it's yours. You can borrow wisdom. Seems to me, though, and I guess this comes because I deal with a lot of young people. We're pretty stubborn about this. I, I've got to say, I'm probably public enemy number one about that. We just don't like to listen to other people because somehow, for some reason, we feel like that diminishes us. Sometimes we seek out advice, but then we only think that the advice is good advice if it's what we were already thinking. Which makes me wonder, why are we seeking advice at all? We're, we're just going to do what we want. You know, maybe wisdom means people are going to disagree with you. In fact, it may be the best wisdom and the most important thing to listen to when someone has the courage to say, you are wrong about this and you need to reconsider. What I want to show you here is that other people can help you see what you don't see. We only have a limited view and we only have a limited experience. Other people can say, look, what you're missing here is this. Or, you know, you think it'll work out like this, but I've seen it work out this way, and you need to watch out for that. Other people can help us see past appearances when we don't see it. Other people can help us see the evil in the voice that we don't hear. Other people can help us see that there is a path here that leads in a place you don't want to go. Other people can help us. If you want to be discerning, listen to other people. So this is at least a starter kit. For discernment. Start with scripture. Look for the spiritual dimension. Learn from your failures and your successes. Live proactively and listen to the wisdom of others. Would you pray with me about it? Our God and Father, we thank you so much for the time that you've given us tonight to open your word, to think together about how we can grow in Christ. Father, we are thankful for the time that we've had together this week to share in your word, uh, to think together about your things. And we pray, Father, that you will be at work through your word in our hearts and lives as we leave this time and as we now have the obligation to apply your word in the varying situations that we encounter. Father, we pray for discernment as your people. We pray that you'll help us to be able to tell the difference between things that are good and evil, to tell the difference in what we should listen to and what we should not to tell the difference in when we should act and when we should not, how to approach people and how not to, all the things that we have worries and concerns about. We need your wisdom and we seek your guidance. Father, pray that you'll help us to have a, a humble heart, to be willing to listen to others, to have the courage to act when action is necessary, but also to know that we don't always know the best way. And I pray, Father, that We'll have a heart that desires to grow closer to you and grow closer to each other, seeing that you are at work in our hearts and in the lives of others. I pray that you'll bless us to this task, that you'll work in us to be the people you want us to be. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for your attention tonight. This is the time of our service where we offer an invitation. If there is someone here who needs to make their life right with the Lord Jesus, by becoming a Christian for the first time, coming to him, putting their faith in him, turning away from their sins, being baptized into Christ. We'd love nothing more tonight than to help you do that. If you have any need, we ask you to come to the front as we stand and sing to encourage you.